Welcome to Create a Coalition Building, our dynamic panel featuring members sharing firsthand experiences for Chicago, Dallas for Words, and Delaware Chapter. We will learn how to engage with community groups like food pantries and schools and use innovative tools like Enrose Climate Solutions Simulators to spark conversation and collaboration. But before we get started, I always like to acknowledge that you're taking time away from your family, your friends, or your hobbies to be here with us, working in something that is so much larger than ourselves, a livable planet. And for that, we at CCL are extremely grateful. My name is Solemi Hernandez, and I'm Citizens Climate Lobby Southeast Regional Coordinator. My work is to support volunteers creating political will in Florida, Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. I am honored to share this space with all of you and with our inspired panelists, Mike Haller and Dana Nails from the Chicago chapter, Kelly Sher and Beda Ganesan from the Dallas for Work chapter, and Beth Changes, Delaware State Coordinator and Phil Smith, co-leader of the Delaware chapter. Each of them bring a wealth of experience in community engagement and coalition building. So let's get started and learn from their insightful work. Each of them are going to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about the work they're doing in their chapters and state. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm, I'm Mike Holler from Citizens Climate Lobby Chicago and a volunteer group leader there. I've been involved with CCL for about two years now a little over two years now, and um, started when there was just early discussions about building coalitions within CCL. Uh, I guess it would be five conferences ago. Um, I really liked that idea coming into it, and I saw that there's a lot of power in connecting local action to what happens nationally and providing safe spaces to um, help people um, become comfortable with participating with CCL and with CCL as an organization of people. Um, before getting into uh, the, the the policies there. So I loved the idea of building those relationships and um, was really interested in in uh, in doing that. And uh, fortunately, um, had some members in, in in the chapter help out and and specifically uh, Dana, who's here right now. Yes, hey everybody, my name is Dana. Um, I've been a volunteer with CCL in the Chicago chapter for a little over a year, and I have also been primarily focused on coalition building and just general community outreach. Um, what me and Mike specifically are gonna be talking about today is our partnership with a local food pantry here called the Pilsen Food Pantry, um, and how that partnership has grown over almost the past year. Um, it started out really that I knew somebody who worked there, and so I had been individually volunteering there. And then after a little while of being in CCL, realized like, hey, I could just bring a group of CCLers to the pantry. They always need more volunteer help. And um, one of the first events that we did was a holiday gift distribution last December, and we were able to distribute gifts to children in the community and much needed food to a bunch of families in the community and had a great time. So um, we've been developing that partnership ever since and going back. So we'll be talking more about that today. Thank you, Dana. So now this going to go to Carrie. Hi, everyone. My name is Kara Shear. I'm 17 and I'm from Dallas, Fort Worth. So I'm the co-leader and co-founder of DFW Gen Green, which is a youth environmental advocacy group that Veda and myself co-founded this year. And I've been part of CCL for a little under a year and I've thoroughly enjoyed it, being able to be part of this group that supports advocacy from all across the country. And it doesn't matter what background you have, your political beliefs, your ages, we all have that support. And so I'll let Veda explain a little bit more about what we're going to be going over, but we are heavily involved with electrification and youth advocacy around that. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Veda. Thank you, Karis. Um, I'm Veda Ganesan. I'm 15 years old and calling from Dallas, Texas. So as Karis said, um, I'm co-founder and co-leader of DFW Gen Green, 
and we are currently working towards school electrification in our local district. So what that means is we are currently building relationships with the local school board and local administrators in order to uh, pass a resolution in order to electrify these schools in LISD. So, um, so far we've like, conducted tabling events and partnered um, with the school board, but we hope to further engage the community and continue developing our relationships with the school board as a coalition and deepening our voices in um, LISD through youth advocacy. So thank you. And we hope to keep elaborating on our electrification journey later on in today's session. Hi, everybody. I'm Beth Chagas. Um, I am the founder of the Delaware chapter, which um, was initiated in 2016, and also the state coordinator. And um, all that time, I've been um, chapter leader. I was recently joined in that with um, a wonderful co-leader, Phil Smith, who has also been my primary partner in a um, coalition building project centered around inroads. So I'm going to turn it over to Phil to talk a little bit about how that's gone. So I'm Phil Smith, and as Beth said, I recently became co-leader of the Delaware chapter. Um, I found CCL about three years ago. Uh, I, when I was retiring as a technical leader from an organization. Um, I've also, once on finding CCL, I went to a couple of presentations about En-ROADS, decided that it really fitted with my science background and technical knowledge that I had. So I learned more and more. Um, I eventually became an En-ROADS climate ambassador and then uh, have been using that to create um, different partnerships with with people around by leading through the Enros presentations and then engaging with other people beyond that. And so we've been particularly focused on the education community, and we'll talk about that, I think, in one of the questions around how that develops in the future. Thank you, Phil, and thank you, everyone. Really, the work you're doing is so different, but so needed because creating partnerships uh, within the places we live is just being present in our communities. And it has such a great benefit because sometimes, I mean, we have friends and community partners that if they have events, we don't even have to go out and be looking for events, they invite us. So that's the case I have here. Uh, we have so many partnerships in my community that they have an event and they just invite us for presentations, uh, tabling events. So let's just jump right into the questions. Considering the power powerful role that coalition building plays in amplifying our collected efforts. Could you elaborate on the broader objectives your chapters hopes to achieve through these partnerships? And please share the foundational inspiration that sparked your projects. And furthermore, how does this experience underscore the importance of coalition building for other chapters looking to magnify their impact and foster a great sense of community within and across their networks. So let's start with Dana. Yeah, so I'll talk a bit more about the food pantry. So basically, as I said, um, we started volunteering there last December. Um, we've been going back about once every month, once every month and a half and bringing a group of people with us. Um, and not just CCLers, actually, we advertise these events publicly. Um, so we've had people actually join and find out about CCL through coming to these food pantry events. Um, so we've found it very powerful, not just in building relationships in our community, but also getting the word out about CCL and, you know, people who are very concerned about climate or very interested in lobbying have actually um, come to stay with us and continue to uh, participate with CCL, which has been very exciting. Um, so I wanted to touch a bit on why other chapters should consider coalition building as well. Um, there's a few different points that I think we've, me, me and Mike have taken from this experience. Um, number one, you know, we do the formal lobbying a couple times a year with CCL, right? And then in between, there's some, some more informal like calls and email campaigns. But besides that, you know, we have a lot of volunteers that are sitting right here in Chicago who are concerned about climate and also care about their community. Um, so we wanted to give, you know, our volunteers and, and people in the community an opportunity to help out, do some hands-on volunteer work. Um, even besides the pantry, we've also partnered with the Parks District to do different uh, tree plantings, like 
trail mulchings, trash cleanups types of events. And we've had you know, a lot of interest generated from that and have been able to make a pretty big impact. Um, and secondly, so besides just you know being able to mobilize the volunteers that we have in the community, we've also been able to partner with other climate related orgs. And in doing that, we've been able to make a bigger impact, have a larger reach. Um, and third, I just say, as I had said before, getting the word out about CCL. Um, like I said, we've had people actually discover what CCL is and, and join us just from showing up at these volunteer events. So by having a more diverse and, and varied range of events that we offer as a chapter, we've been able to draw a much more diverse crowd when it comes to all different types of backgrounds. So um, those are just a few points that we have on why you should also consider coalition building in your chapter. Yeah, and on top of that, um, I wanted to talk about um, specifically we we have in Chicago, we have a very challenging problem where we have uh, literally nine congressional districts that are in the city area, which probably sounds crazy to some people here, but it's it's a huge challenge for us. Right. And so in order to engage all of those areas, we need to be in all of those areas and it can be challenging for us if if you know we. Uh, the chapter doesn't yet live close by those areas. We're trying to build connections in those areas. What better way to build those connections by working with groups that are already there and you know meeting people who go to the food pantry regularly and just talking and being around. We started like an informal. Uh, so Pilsen is a is a, um, a, a, a more Mexican area of Chicago. So there's there's a lot of um, well, the taco shops, and so we've made it a tradition to go to go to go to get tacos after a volunteering event, and just invite people along. Um, some people that came with CCL, some were already there. We just have some good conversations, and um, you know, I, I know a lot of people here are probably familiar with the Yale Climate Opinion Surveys, and one of the things that we do uh, very little is talk about climate, even though we all agree that it's a problem. And being in those conversations is really important. Um, that helps build trust with their organization and show people that it's an effective organization. And um, and, and also there's two, two stories that I wanna share. Um, so we had a, a separate partnership with, um, with uh, a group called Open Lands here that does tree stewardship. And we, um, we did a tree planting in a neighborhood in Chicago. Uh, I was in a meeting with a freshman member of Congress uh, last uh, last June in DC. And you know we were started with gratitude as we always do at CCL. And then we talked about what CCL is, what we've been doing. And we mentioned this tree planting we did. And the member of Congress, their, their, their eyes lit up and they said, oh, I went to school there. I literally went to school there, right? We didn't know that ahead of time. But by being out there and in different places in the community, we're able to build these connections. And you know, some of them will amount to you know huge moments like that. Some of them won't. Um, but we'll still meet cool people throughout, and it, it's you know rejuvenating. We work on national policy. It's it moves slowly. When you go volunteer at a food pantry or at, you know plant a tree, you can see some lasting impact and 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 get some some enjoyment out of that. And another thing um, to to end another thing that we've. We've done with uh, one of another one of our stewardship events. This was two Saturdays ago. Is we tried to connect the local action to national action. So another one of our volunteers wrote a letter um, and asked people there, uh, present, shared it with people there, and asked them if they felt compelled to sign. And so I'm here uh, on Monday. I'm going to deliver this. But we have 25 signatures to um, a, a member of Congress in the area where we volunteered, and we we taught people about why that's important. Um, so there's all these different ways that you can connect to things and we can bring these extra uh, add-ins like you know these letters to it because we didn't bring the materials to that event, another group brought them, right? So we can bring our creativity towards teaching people in a broader way. Thank you, Mike. And uh, let's go ahead with Carrie. It was actually Alveda who had the answer for this one, sorry. Veda, sorry, sorry, Carrie, let it go ahead. Yes, thank you. So um, as DFW Jen Green and speaking for both Karis and I, we believe that as youth coalition building is essential for making change. So even as youth, just rallying your voices together and presenting yourself as one to the community, to the school board and to your local leaders is a very impactful in the long run. So together, we are working towards our independent school district, Louisville ISD, to pledge for electrification. So holistically, we um, realize that it's a timely and rigorous process, but we leave that this generation is uniquely positioned to advocate uh, for change. So as I heard about like the idea on electrification for CCL, I was really intrigued and I found it like a super interesting idea. So Karis and I actually 
Um, I think we randomly one day met at one of these CCL conferences like this, and we realized we both shared a passion for making change as youth, and especially regarding electrification. So we swapped contacts and had a whole email chain, and then we started working towards electrification. We started talking to the uh, members of the school district, tabling at our local high schools, and it's really just an incredible process. So I'm personally motivated by the fact that as a team, we can really enact real change to promote a healthier and more effective lifestyle in our school district. So seeing like the major wins and losses along the way has inspired our team. And we have just through that reflected on our whole process. Like how was the um, board meeting? We just had a board meeting like a few days ago with um, some of the members of our independent school district. And through that, e after each meeting, we reflect as a coalition to see how can we strengthen and increase our relationships with the people in our school district and what are they looking for and what are we trying to enact? So in the CCL way, expressing gratitude and connecting with them and what they want to see happen and what we want to see happen. We are building those relationships and um, also kind of growing our mission as a coalition. So we're working alongside the board to make this happen. So in addition to this, um, our coalition hopes to ignite the passion for environmental conservation, sustainability, and climate conversations within the community, like whether that be through tabling or presentations, community events, shows, and more. So our future steps, we're planning to talk at more board meetings and engage the communities through op-eds and other uh, media outlets um, to kind of further our coalition um, and our goals. So as for why other chapters should um, consider coalition building, uh, especially from a youth lens, I think if we at least inspire a few youth to form a coalition, I would feel really successful in what I'm doing today. So I think youth are really and uniquely positioned in their um, in their society. Like Gen Generation Z is such a, a very advocating generation and they have such a powerful voice that I think if they used more and utilized in a better way and formed coalitions that we're talking about today, they could advocate for any type of change that could happen, whether that be from climate change, electrification or anything else like that. So inspiring youth to utilize their voice and not only rely on just the guidance of adults every step of the way, I think a movement of electrification could really sweep across the nation if they form their own coalitions and engage in relationships and kind of deepen those relationships with other like-minded in individuals and with um, their adults and peers and board members, I think that really change can be enacted through coalitions. So I think that we have a real chance of limiting our negative impact on the earth, and I guarantee that this will be followed by even more climate conscious initiatives. So Karis, do you have any extra words to add on that? You basically covered most everything of what I feel too, but really just put hammering in that nail of youth getting together and raising our voices, especially with social media being more prevalent than it's ever been before. We have an extremely unique position to let ourselves be heard from a very, very early stage. So even if we may not be old enough to vote, we can talk to those who can, we can set ourselves up to be that next generation of powerful voters who are voting for climate conscious policies and politicians and just overall connecting youth. That was my main part with that. Thank you. Thank you, Gary and Vera. Those were very inspiring insights. Uh, let's, uh, Beth. Um, I think I'm gonna let Phil take the, the first part of this one to describe how, um, how this coalition got started. Sure. Okay. So, um, as I said, I came into uh, Citizens Climate Lobby and learned about En-ROADS and became an En-ROADS Climate Ambassador. Um, one of the other things that I got involved in was be, I was an external advisor to um, the Climate Science and Policy Hub, which is a new thing that was formed in the University of Delaware. So that was just getting started and I was added to the advisory board for that. On a few occasions, I was asked to come in and talk. And one of the really interesting things that you can do with En-ROADS is rather than coming in and saying, you should do this, En-ROADS allows you to find out what the people that you're talking to cares about. So you can have a very open conversation. It doesn't have to be necessarily directed at any specific policy or solution. You can find out what they care about, and then you can have the conversation continuing to build upon that and see how good or bad or where the policy solutions get you to one of the things it always does though um and you can learn about enroads is a free tool that you can learn about 
from climateinteractive.org. And I think maybe the links might show up in the chat, but there's a link to the, the model that you can use and it's free. They also have a free training class online that you can learn everything online. Um, but one of the things when you go to any presentation, you always know the CCLers in the audience because they go, put a price on carbon. And price on carbon is a really effective thing to do. So that naturally leads from a conversation about climate change and policies in general to, okay, a price on carbon is really good. And then, well, what does CCL do? And CCL is a, a, a vehicle to try and learn more and to lobby with Congress people. And then there's a serendipity that happens. So now I'll pass that back to Beth. So oh, one of the other things that we did is that we then had a, um, a group of 12 climate, um, climate scholars from that school. Actually, I mentored them through the training course. So we had 12 people who were ready to be climate ambassadors to go and talk to local communities and within their university environment. Now I'll pass it to Beth. Okay, so we're at the stage where we have 12 undergraduate students who are who are trained and ready to make presentations as part of their climate um, and roads ambassadorship. And so um, they, they seem to feel that their best um, audience would be of their own age or younger. And their talk began about how to um, introduce and in roads into our local public schools using um, these climate trained climate scholars as as the presenters. Um, Phil as backup and everything, but but let them take the lead. Um, and that was moving along, but at kind of a slow pace. And at just about that time, I was having conversations with people in general. It was sort of uh, the beginning of the school year. Um, I was just catching up with a, a professor friend of mine. She's a geology professor, retired, who was thinking in her retirement, she was interested in getting in some climate work. And she knew that I kind of did that. And could I point her in some direction? She said, I know you lobby, but I don't really think that's for me. But knowing that she was professorly, I thought, hey, maybe she'd be interested in En-ROAD. So I mentioned that to her. She went off, looked at the website, said, yes, that is great. And not only that, she spent a lot of her career on science pedagogy. So now we have someone who's really um, a great teacher getting involved in En-ROADS. My next conversation was at a back to school party with a whole bunch of academic types um, from the University of Delaware. And this time it was the wife of the Dean of Agricultural Sciences, who's a plant scientist herself saying, boy, I've been doing some work in the schools and I am really afraid that we are not teaching um, high school students enough about climate change. What can we do? What can we do? And so she now has become a member of this growing team. And it turns out she has a connection with the science curriculum director of this local school district that we're interested in getting into. So, um, so that was a key to unlock the door to the um, to the school district. Um, meetings are, you know, this is kind of all just happening recently. So meetings are continuing um, with this curriculum director, her science department chairs and so forth about how we can best um, make presentations or, you know, use um, En-ROADS in the curriculum that already exists. And um, so we are very hopeful to, to be doing some of that in the spring semester. Thank you, Beth. And thank you everyone for sharing the amazing work you're doing and, and all your vision with your partnerships. So we know that when we build coalitions and we work in the building political will for climate solutions, there's a lot of challenges and it's not always perfect. So considering this, in your journey of building coalitions, what challenges have you personally encountered? And I, I and could you offer us any strategies or tips for from your experience that might help us in overcoming social hurdles? And I'm going to start with Mike again or Dana. Yeah, I can start, and then Mike. I think if there's anything else that I may have should have mentioned i'll pass it to you afterwards 
Um, so I think when it comes to the challenges, I think just initially, Mike and I at least had a lot of different conversations about which types of groups we would want to partner with. Um, as he had mentioned earlier, we personally started by looking at congressional districts in the city where we didn't have a lot of representation because you know there's so many districts here and we want to make sure that we have representation in all of them. So when we started looking at those districts, we identified a bunch of groups that we found online and we're trying to consider, you know, would this be, um, you know, like a good partnership to have? Is it is it climate related? Um, how do we get in contact with, with people and even start to build a partnership? How do we go about that? So I think, um, yeah, after sort of a lot of iterating, what we kind of came down to was that um, one of the things we found very useful was Actually, if you're interested in looking to get involved with a certain group, especially if they have volunteer events, um, just go there, like actually just go there and volunteer and not going there necessarily as like, hello, I'm with CCL. Let me tell you all about carbon fee and dividend. It, it's kind of like we can show up there and and help them out and volunteer, just not necessarily as a transactional thing, but for us to get um, the sense of what is this group about. And, you know, if it comes up kind of organically, just telling them a bit about like, oh yeah, we you know volunteer in the climate space. Like here's a bit about what we do, but um, we found that to be like pretty effective. Just the more that you show up and have like natural organic conversations, even Beth, like you were talking about earlier, um, it it's pretty effective, honestly. And you get to really connect with people who um, are actually pretty concerned about climate should you find them at these events. And you also just get to help out a local group in your community. So even if it, doesn't necessarily always blossom into something huge. Um, at, at the very least, you walk away and you've you've helped. Um, so that's like one suggestion I would have, or we would have, you know, if you're struggling to identify certain groups and maybe it's feeling quite overwhelming, like which ones do we actually start reaching out to, just, just show up. Um, sometimes it, that can be the most helpful thing. Um, I think also just want to make sure that I, I touch on everything. Um, one other thing that we've mentioned before too is that um, you know, we're here talking about a food pantry. That's not necessarily like the first thing you would think about is like, oh, we we want to have a partnership with a climate related group. Let's go food pantry. Um, so we would also recommend that if you're like having uh, if you're struggling to identify certain groups to partner with, don't necessarily only go with like fully um, like classic climate organizations. Like try to think about things that are climate related, like for this food pantry specifically they help eliminate a lot of food waste. Um, you know, a lot of food that would otherwise go to waste in our community, they take that and they distribute it to people who need it right now. Um, they do the same thing with clothes as well. They have a whole clothes donation um, section of their pantry. So um, they are eliminating a lot of waste. So it is like climate related as well, but ultimately they have a huge impact on the community and we've been able to build some really good partnerships there. Um, so yeah, main recommendations would just be um, again, showing up at those groups, like really connecting with people face to face, one on one, seeing how that partnership could build. And then also just thinking a bit outside the box when it comes to groups that you would partner with doesn't necessarily always have to be um, directly climate related, I guess. And, um, and I want, Mike, I want to add to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to, it, Dana's touching on this, but just to like say it, everything is climate related, right? I think we've heard that at some point here. Um, and if we all if we all believe that, uh, you, be creative with your thinking, right? Think about your food pantries. Think about um, think about um, uh, you know crime crime and, and violence in communities and the ways that people are mitigating that. There's organizations that work with work with building parks and natural areas, to provide community spaces, right? And there's so many things that are crime that are sorry are um, climate related. Um, everything is. It's just a matter of how we can justify it and how we can support it. Um, and how we can follow the values that we hold as, as CCL. The other and the most important thing that I personally want you to take away from this, everyone who's here listening, is, uh, a, is a point about sensitivity, right? So uh, there's questions in the chat that I, I've been seeing around, um, around a very strong far left organization, a very, a very conservative area, people from basically both sides of political extremes, um, marginalized communities that have a hard time letting letting people in with different beliefs. Um, you know, 
feel things out. The food pantry was great because they let us they let us sign uh, sign up and go help out, and 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 they don't they, they don't they don't care where their help's coming from. Generally speaking, um, other organizations might be pickier and also might not like you talking about CCL right away. They're an organization trying to do their own thing in the community, and uh, you need to build trust. Right. So really, really um, feel things out. If something is um, if something you, you, you think is is very clear and open, then, you know, you can be very clear and open. Talk to the organizer of the event. Talk to someone there. Um, if something is is clearly a little bit more isolated, like, you know, a community garden in in a, a, um, a um, disinvested area of the community, for example, um, you know, go go as a single person and and talk talk to have some deep conversations about why you're there, um, and and why why you're excited to see that that place become better. Um, just be sensitive. Thank you, Mike and Carrie. I think is is that Carrie says that's you next. Hopefully, I got it right this way this time. I believe Veda had our first part for this, and then All I was right. going to like anything. Go ahead, it. Veda. Yeah, I'll be highlighting the challenges and then Karis will take over with the solutions. So we initially started the uh, our electrification journey this year, actually. So we're still in the beginning stages. But I think most of the challenges that we have um, faced so far have been with just starting and then like just kind of growing so far. So I guess our hurdles have ranged from just uh, re getting responses to cold emails, connecting with others, and um, also tailoring our resolution specifically to a conservative board, and also forming meaningful relationships with the board members. Because you know they're volunteer members, so they're not always free, and they don't always have these clear schedules. So just working with them and kind of forming those deeper relationships has taken time and a little bit of effort, but we're working with that um, gradually so that we can make sure that happens. So I would say that's been the biggest challenge so far. Aside that, I think also finding outlets to display our message is also important because as youth, we're able to do it through schools and other places. Um, but we need to kind of make sure our outreach is spread out to more to audiences that adults can also hear as well. So that's why we're in the process of sending out op-eds to our local newspapers. And I think just recently, um, I had a blog published on the National CCL website about electrification. So doing things like that, we want to make sure our message is heard from uh, both local audience, kids, adults, and all the different types of people. So that, I think that's when one of our main challenges kind of um, addressing our target audience. Um, but besides that, as youth, we're able to kind of combat this um, situation and especially talking to the board, but making sure we're really um, thorough with our research. And by talking to a conservative board, we really nailed on the economic benefits and implementation of our um, implementation of our resolution. So through that, we've been able to adapt to these challenges. Whatever the board is kind of handing us, whatever feedback they're giving us, we're adapting our resolution and our presentation to that. So for example, um, in our school district, Louisville ISD, um, they are recently implementing a bond. And of course, that's going to um, affect our resolution because we need to finance our electrification of all the schools somehow, right? So through our thorough research and everything like that, we've implemented, we've integrated the board's bond into our plan. So we'll fund electrification through bonds, grants, rebates, and other stuff like that. And so that Louisville can also be self-sufficient. So kind of adapting to what the board says in the current situation is really important, especially if you want to grow um, as your coalition is adapting. So I think that's important. So, and uh, kind of addressing the, um, point of reaching out to others and making sure that our mission is heard and gaining um, community traction and support. We've been constantly communicating with board members and make sure to emailing to make sure to email and um, contact each other on a timely basis. And we've been also communicating on social media. And as I mentioned earlier, sending out op-eds, making presentations at schools, tabling and doing other presentations. And we hope that sometime in the future, we can also do a sustainable art show to make sure our message is heard and get uh, more signatures on our petition. I think so far we've gotten about like, um, I think a hundred from both online and um, paper forms. So I think that's been good. Just making sure that members of the community know who we are know what we're doing and know our message and making sure that we do really thorough research and um, planning beforehand is really important and working together as a team team to make sure that happens is, I guess, the steps for success here. So I'll hand it over to Karis to talk about more of the solutions. 
So I think a big thing with that, that is a lot of that takes time to plan. So I'm sure many of us can uh, get used to the fact that there's like long work days or there's school hours. I mean, with school hours, we legally have to be there a certain amount of hours. So having a time just to dedicate to planning out your progress ahead of time. So like me and Veda, we meet once a week and we just have like an hour long phone call to plan for the whole week. So making sure that you build in that time to plan ahead is crucial. And also making sure that you're just using all the resources available to you. So Sharon is also on this call and her leadership and the other leaders of the National Youth Action Team and Citizens Climate Lobby Youth have been extremely helpful in providing us with resources and templates, links for research. Um, right now, um, the CCL Youth intern, one of them, his name's Lathan, and he's doing us a huge favor by helping us with a conservative resolution since we do have a more conservative board. And also just making sure, like Veda said, making sure you have your research for what your district's already done and showing appreciation for what they have done and sort of guiding the conversation what can still be done off of that, as well as just making sure that they're aware that you have support within your community. So we've had a huge success with our petition and we've also had a huge success with getting youth engaged and getting responses for those emails. So we were always following up on those emails. So again, communication being key. And we were getting responses not only from the school board, but I also personally have a meeting set up with my campus admin Monday morning. So just making sure that we're consistently taking those steps to engage with the leadership above us is crucial. And like Veda already said, again, just going over it, making sure that you also have that press coverage, getting those op-eds out, getting statements out, and staying connected with other climate advocates who are doing similar work is huge. So overall, just community and communication are huge. Thank you, Beda and Carrie. Uh, Phil, is that you next sure. for this question? Okay, yeah. I got it right for the first no, time. No, the, <laughs> no, we're running out of time a little bit. Um, one of the things we do in En-ROAD is having somebody to do the presentations, but also people to support them. So you've got to learn to train to keep up and there's, that's effort. But having somebody who can actually find you those meetings and help schedule and help support is really important important the other thing is i mean I, we were specifically focused on education right now but you may not have those links to the education community but we all come in with a network of people around us who can be those things and you never know who out of your network is going to be the next conversation that could open up something like this and as Catherine hayhoe says the most important thing about climate change is to actually talk about it and i also saw there was a a comment or a question in one of the, the group leader sessions where somebody said, I'm, you know, did you talk to your parents after this when you had a disagreement? So people you have a disagreement with, you might not want to have those conversations. You don't feel comfortable having a conversation about what you're actually doing, but it's really valuable if you do. So if you can open up to those people around you and have conversations about it, those people who are interested in the work that you do on climate change, and you know, like Beth said, you know, I know you do this climate change thing. What do you do? I was on a run this morning with a, a medical professional who was like, oh, I'm interested in what you do. And that's going to open another, another conversation. So having those conversations, one thing leads to another, and then you'll probably find synergies within your group of people who make those connections. Delaware's small, right? Everybody knows everybody. So it's easier that way. But making those connections and talking about it, it feels hard, right? Last, last year, we were asked to get 10 people to sign up for this. Get, you know, you don't want to open up or fear of somebody saying, well, why do you do that? It's a waste of time. But it's a really valuable thing to find out who around you cares about the things that you do as well. So you're not isolated. I'll leave it at that. And I'll, I'll just add um, a couple of things that pick up on what some of the other panelists have said. Um, you know, a, I think it was uh, Mike who said, a CCL presentation isn't always the most appropriate or welcome thing. Um, you know, we we have great resources to do that in a in a very open way. But sometimes people will know that if you're going to do a CCL presentation, that probably means you're going to you know present a very specific viewpoint, ask them to join something they might not be so interested in. En Roads is a more policy neutral thing. It's more about um, exploring various solutions, and so it can it can open some doors. Um, you know, as we mentioned, it, it can lead to the discussion that the best policy solutions that come out of the model 
are related to CCL, but it's it's um it's a good tool for for opening a door to um you know to further discussions about climate in general and and then maybe eventually CCL and is often a, a more welcome um, presentation. Um, and the other thing I wanted to pick up on was the the youth action team which also has a really great curriculum developed around En-ROADS. So if, um, as we are doing, if, if the partnership involves education, that is a, is a wonderful resource to draw on. Um, it's aimed at middle school, which I think is the perfect place for either taking it a little higher level or a little lower level. Um, and, and it just is, has been a really helpful thing in, in our coalition as well. Thank you to everyone and all our panelists for those insightful, insightful perspectives. Um, I always approach, uh, and, and if you want to take something away from building partnerships with CCL and other organizations in your community, one thing that I always approach all my uh, partnership with is this quote from Theodore Roosevelt, People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So as Dana was saying at the beginning, you know, just go be a helpful or a service in your community and the partnership will develop uh, with time and with trust. So thank you all again. Uh, we have very little short time for questions. Uh, Jeff, do we have any questions for from our attendees today? So I think we're just gonna have time for one question. Yeah, so we had a couple of questions, which I'd like to combine here, which is basically focusing on how have you gone about working with other specific nonprofit organizations, as well as specifically faith related groups? Someone mentioned that as an interest. I'm from our panelists. Feel free to jump in. Uh, I can say something about um, one thing that we're doing in Delaware. Um, it's a small state, so I'm not sure that how many places this will apply, but uh, you know we have chapters of, of most of the major environmental organizations and so forth, and, um, and, and especially to work on legislation and issues at the state level, we have developed what we call the Clean Energy Coalition, um, and a CCL Delaware is a part of that. Um, so, that's one thing that you could look for or think about instigating in your area um, when you have common interest. Don't, sometimes sign-on letters are, are drafted and so forth, and it may not completely be in, in CCL's wheelhouse, and we will opt out of that one. Others, we will sign on or testify um, at the state house about things, um, but that, that's another suggestion, how to work with local um, nonprofits. Yeah, um, in Chicago, we've had we've, we've worked with a, a couple. Um, there's a, 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 a it, it's all very situational, I would say, though. Um, so there's a group um, they're called the Trash People of Logan Square that that set up a volunteer fair uh, every uh, every season. And so we've participated in that and and um, and, and shown that that we're we're willing to support them and, and, and do more as needed. Um, there's the group called Open Lands, which is the one that plants trees. So we're 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 engaged as volunteers, and we're we're um, trying to start to walk up the ladder and, and have more connections and co uh, conversations about, um, you know, how we can how we can build that connection. Um, there's uh, there's a group called uh, Plant Chicago, um, which uh, interestingly enough, there's volunteers at right now, um, doing a tabling event. So the fun never stops. Um, but. Uh, but there's there a uh, there a, it's like a circular uh, resource education group um, from you know urban farming and aquaculture to um, you know composting and, and things like that and um, you know we've we've talked to to uh, volu well leading leading volunteers there and they've connected us sort of up the line and we've been able to we were at one point able to host a, a, a climate advocate education section that was session that was bilingual uh, a, a while ago. Um, it, it's just a question about, you know, be creative. Uh, what you think you're going into uh, when when you talk to these organizations, and not what you'll come out of it. 
Um, and and uh, if you go into these these uh, situations thinking about what you'll get out of it, uh, I'll tell you that you're very likely to uh, to to you know to 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 fail. You're very likely to um, to to fall flat and maybe even hurt the relationship because you're trying to force something that isn't there. Um, work together, right? Work together. Uh, I know we all here feel that that climate is the most important thing, and that's why we've chosen to spend and volunteer our time here. But just like we feel climate is the most important thing, people might feel that access to food is the most important thing. People might feel that an urban canopy that's equitable is the most important thing. And uh, who are we to tell them that, that they're wrong? We need to support that and figure out how we can work together rather than try to, um, to, uh, to you know, jump right in. And there was a, there was a, a quote that stuck with me. Um, from the the June conference, not last one, but the one before, the one that really started me thinking about about coalition building. Uh, this was not one of the things that got me start started to think about coalition building. But there was a quote: um, uh, "Never bring a wedding proposal to a first date." And CCLers do that all the time. I don't know if anyone was was at that conference that heard about that. Uh, but yeah, you're passionate about climate. We get that. Um, that's great. And uh, and and that's the way we need to be. But that's not necessarily the way we need to be when we're working with other organizations. We need to be passionate about what they're doing too, um, because we're all trying to help the community in the end. Thank you, Mike. What a great way to close the conference with that amazing quote. And as we conclude this session, I'd like to express my profound gratitude to our amazing panelists for the insightful contributions and to all of you for all your engaging questions that even though we didn't have the time to get to it, uh, we, we can email you the answers and follow up on it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.